Welcome to the Richie Flow Nutrition Podcast. My name is Cameron Borg. On this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with Jim Laird. Jim is an experienced strength and conditioning and health coach. Since 1997, he has empowered clients from diverse backgrounds to achieve their goals. From everyday individuals to professional athletes in the NFL, CFL, LPGA, and NBL, Jim helps clients unlock their potential. He's renowned for delivering exceptional outcomes efficiently, focusing on optimal health along with strength. With his motto, train smarter, not harder, Jim's approach has earned praise from experts. Partnering with Dr. Leland Stillman, he brings a unique coaching style that combines fitness, nature, and outdoor activities for overall well-being. He has recently moved to Nicaragua, where he's building a gym on the beach to allow people to focus on their strength in an environment that is actually healthy. I've known Jim for a few years now, and he's just one of those special people whose wisdom and extremely generous approach to coaching pulls into focus what really matters when you're trying to help people make meaningful changes in their lives. He's taught me a lot, mainly because he's done so much in his life so far, and he's able to explain extremely complex ideas many different ways to make them understandable no matter who you are. Jim exemplifies all the qualities needed to help people on their healing journeys. With all this being said, I really hope you enjoy our conversation. Well, Jim, it's really good to see you again. It's been too long since we uh, since we caught up, so um, I'm really excited to sort of delve a little bit deeper with you. Absolutely, I'm, I'm, it's uh, it's hard when you're on the other side of the world. You know, it's uh, you kind of miss. You know, right now it's evening. We're getting close to sunset here in Nicaragua, and you're you're probably starting your day. Yep. Yeah, exactly. It's so a bit difficult uh, in, in Australia. Sure. Mm. So we've known for a while, but I've never really heard your full backstory, understood, you okay. know, how you got to how you got to where you are today. And and yeah. One thing I know how about far, you is, how far back do you want to go? Well, I I guess I'll leave that up to you. But um, you know, you're you're someone I've met who's got so much wisdom um in you and that's because i've done a lot of really dumb things (laughs) done a lot of dumb things done a a lot of stupid things uh and so i've learned the hard way many times uh i'm the kind of person that has to run off the road at 160 kilometers an hour to kind of figure things out i'll talk i'll talk metric i am canadian so i can talk metric with you but um yeah i've just i've had a lot of great amazing mentors um i've destroyed my health in, in many, many different ways. And I've had to rebuild my life a number of different times. So um, that's a big part of what has allowed me to help uh, a lot of other people. And a lot of people resonate with me because um, I'm, they might not have been ex- as extreme as I, I was or am, but um, I, I can relate to uh, a lot of people having a hard time uh, learning how to manage being driven, uh, knowing when to rest and when to push. I think a lot of people really struggle with that. Um, and then um, I think a big part of, of, of who I am was learning how to um, really like get to get to have a good relationship with myself. I, I didn't have a good relationship with myself for a long time. I had a incredibly horrible childhood. Um, I, I mean, horrible is in relative terms. I mean, you can read, there's a lot of people who have had a lot worse off than I have had, but, um, you know, I, it wasn't great. And, uh, a lot of the problems I got myself into were me trying to find value in myself, uh, through activities and, and that usually doesn't end well. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, trial and error, and uh, I think a lot of people that are highly driven, a lot of highly successful athletes, uh, generally, a lot of them are, are, are dealing with, with trauma, right? And so what happens when you deal with that trauma and you forgive some people and you move on from those things, then why do you train? Like you kind of have to find a new motivation to... Uh... So a lot of that was reinventing myself. Like, why am I actually training hard? You know, I'm, I'm not doing it to manage anger anymore. I mean, we can, you know, I've been all over the place, but we can start wherever you like. But, uh, but I think, you know, I've, I've done, I've, I've been on the high level performance things, pushing performance wise. You know, I played college football. I, I wrestled at a high level, uh, competed in powerlifting at a high level. Uh, I've trained and mentored under some of the greatest coaches in the world. I've competed against some very amazing uh, people in different sports, MMA, wrestling, football. Um, 
you know, so I've been on the performance side of things. And then I've also had to deal with the health side of things where I've, um, you know, have had to basically really have come to Jesus moments and really get myself in a better place on two separate occasions um, where my life was, was literally uh, on the line. So um, most people haven't been on both sides of the spectrum. Uh, I've been on both. So a lot of people, a lot of people have either been on one or the other, and I've been on both multiple times. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's super interesting you bringing up the trauma aspect. This is something that a couple of years ago became very clear in my mind, how important it was, um, not only in mental health, but also how it manifests physically. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, there were a couple of times, um, where just by sheer coincidence, you know, I was checking in with, um, yourself and Dr. Stillman and we, we both happened to be reading, um, Joe Dispenza and, uh, Mm -hmm. Marcel van der Kolk, uh, you know, at the same time. And, and I remember him telling me, you know, there's only so much I can do for patients who have these issues because sometimes this is the, this is the basis of where everything's happening. And yes, I can't go in there and fix that. Um, and it seems like this is one of the things that has sort of driven you. Like you said, wisdom is correlated with the amount of mistakes that you've made. Um, sure. And I think it's people look at mistakes as bad things, but uh, in in time, uh, it contextualizes them. And, you know, if you really stick to your guns, they make sense in the end. So. I'm wondering what your perspective is on on trauma and helping people understand why it's there and and what it can do for you if you right. if you listen and pay attention. <clears throat> trauma or stress or challenges is what makes us who we are, right? And uh, I struggled with this for years with some of the things I was exposed to as a child. Uh, some of the things I was told, some of the things that were programmed into me. Why, why is this? Why, why, why? But then I changed it over to, okay, this was a narrative that I had no choice that was put in front of me that I, I can literally reprogram and then I can, I can do things to help other people, right? Um, the Body Keeps Score is an incredible book. Um, some of the things that these people have gone through, um, I just... I, I just am amazed. I, I don't know if you've read that book or not, but if, if you haven't read it, I, w- I would seriously, when you read it, just be, be aware that there's going to be some really crazy stuff that you're going to be exposed to that some things that I, I just even couldn't imagine some of these things these people have gone through and they're able to overcome it. Um, it's looking within yourself and being able to be silent that's where all the healing happens. And that's where you really need to realize, you know, you might need to forgive some people. You might need to forgive yourself, but it's really, it's difficult because you don't want to do that work. There's nothing worse. I, for years, I pushed all this hatred and anger that I was carrying around uh, deep inside of myself and distracted myself with football, with work, with girls, with whatever it is. And and every once in a while, the closet would burp open and I would just, you know, shove that door closed instead of actually dealing until one day I I couldn't do it anymore. I got ultra colitis and like, it was 2008 or 2009. Yeah, I was around, it was around, yeah, somewhere in there. uh, There was the the combination of I was in a car wreck. I I broke up. I was coming out of a bad relationship. I, I, I had, um, the financial crisis had hit and instead of me being smarter, uh, and, you know, reducing, you know, being, you know, reducing my spending and all that, I started bouncing at a nightclub on the weekends, plus working from five in the morning till six or eight at night, you know, in the gym, plus training like a maniac. I was competing in powerlifting at the time. Um, and I ended up just one day sat on the toilet and I was like, Oh my gosh, just about bled to death, you know? went to the hospital, the whole deal. And I was just like, whoa, I've got to make some serious changes. Started doing some reading and it was like, okay, autoimmune disease, ultra colitis usually involves trauma, car accidents. He's usually, you know, I started looking into people like Paul check. That's when I, I ran across Rob Wolf who I'd met actually in college. Very interesting. 
But I realized like what a shit show my life was, right? And that I was using sports and work and all these things to manage all these things that were spinning around in my head. And I finally, you know, came to the conclusion that I needed to not only learn how to relax, which I had no idea how to do. Um, I thought a day off from the gym was, was basically um, not training, right? But when, you're, when you have a 12 or 14 hour work day, uh, and you're, and you're training, you know, multiple sports teams and you've got all this stuff going on. That's not a day off from the gym, right? That that's not a day off in general. Um, and then, so I had to learn how to like shut off and it took me a long time. So I used, I changed my diet. I started managing my stress. I started learning about like the stress bathtub and I emptied my bathtub and I made my bathtub bigger through doing things like float tank and medication, meditation, walking, uh, you know, uh, learning from Paul check, you got to work in so you can work out and then changing my diet helped. And then I started using nicotine in, in moderate dosages and that really helped with my colitis and then acupuncture and all those sort of things. And I got myself under control and that's when I really started to implement, you know, the importance of sleep and rest with my clients. And I got even better results with my clients. And that's what, you know, it amazes me that there's all this information now and people are like, well, you have to do this and you have to do that. I mean, I've seen people get better just by walking outside a couple of times a day and drinking more water and that makes them better. That gets them what they want. I've seen people that have done everything, moved to the equator, if they've done all the things and it still doesn't work for them. And until they finally like do some EMDR therapy and some emotional work, or I've seen people that literally are so obsessive about everything that it's causing more stress. And they finally just say, F it, you know what? F it. I'm going to have a beer. I'm going to have some freaking nachos and I'm going to enjoy my life. And all of a sudden they get better. Right. So everybody's out there like, you've got to do this. You've got to do that. For me, that's what I needed to do at the time. And then fast forward a few more years down the road, you know, I'm still working long hours. I'm doing a better job. I'm going to float tank. I'm doing all these things. And, uh, but I've got a gym with several employees and, and, you know, I'm working from five in the morning till eight o'clock at night and uh, I'm dating this girl and she's like, your feet are disgusting. You know, you're inside all day, you're sweating, you're, you know, she's like, you need to get a pedicure. And I was like, okay, I'll get a pedicure. Four days later, I'm getting my, ready to have my leg amputated <laughs> because of from a staph infection. So here I am back against the the grill. I'm like, well, I'm managing my stress. I'm eating better. I'm 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 working out. I'm you know I'm training and uh, I'm sleeping a little bit better. You know, but I'm still working long hours. And 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 then so I get this other wake up call that uh, you know a different health challenge. And so I'm like, what's going on with this? So I was able to beat that with some antibiotics, but it kept coming back. And you know, they told me, hey, like you've got this, this is something you're going to deal with the rest of your life. This infection is going to come back and it's going to show up as like, um, kind of like you got the flu, but you don't have respiratory symptoms. And then you're going to get like fever and then you're going to go septic, right? You can take, you need to take oral antibiotics. And then, you know, we're just going to have to stay on top of this. And sure enough, it was coming back two or three times a year. And this went on for a year or two. <clears throat> and then I ran into Dr. Jack Cruz, who I think you just recently had on your podcast. And I started you know, this guy with, you know, was saying some very controversial things and pissed a bunch of people off at Paleo FX and, you know, about not, you know, shouldn't eat a banana in December and in, in Boston and people were just losing their minds. And I was like, this sounds like a guy I need to get to know. So I started talking to him and he's like, dude, like, so tell me about your life. And I'm like, well, I, I get up at five in the morning. I train people till about eight o'clock at night. He's like, when's the last time you saw sunrise? I'm like, uh, since I was a little kid. Um, he's like, do you go outside at all? I'm like, if I do, I wear sunglasses. And he's like, dude, like the sun runs your entire immune system. So this was a huge wake up call to me. And I'd become an indoor zoo animal essentially. And so I immediately made some major changes because I was getting to the point where the antibiotics were not working anymore. You know, I would get sick and I'd have to go to the hospital and they're like, okay, we're going to put you on three or four IV antibiotics and we're not really sure if this is going to work. And so so I made, I got my skin in the game and I made a serious lifestyle change. I mean, I remember the first time I went out in the sun without sunglasses and my eyes were watering and I was like, I was crying, right? And now it's the opposite. I mean, I can go out, you know, right now I can look at the sun, it's setting right over there and stare at it and it doesn't bother me at all. 
Um, I go into a store, like say I go into Managua, there's not a lot of fake lights here. Like that's one of the things I like about it. There's no street lights here. The lights here are very dim. Uh, half the time the electricity goes out. Um, but if I go into Managua and go into Walmart, my eyes hurt now from the fake light. And so I canceled all my morning sessions and, um, started getting outside in the mornings, even in the winter time. Uh, started getting more skin in the game, started doing more red light, changed the riding environment at my gym. And then all of a sudden I didn't have another reoccurring infection. Started, you know, went to a couple of Dr. Cruz's events. That's where I met Dr. Stillman, started hanging out with Dr. Stillman. And that's when, you know, I really started looking into opening a gym outdoors because I really felt guilty because I was like, okay, I have a platform where I can share people the importance of circadian rhythms and but I was like, okay, so I'm telling people to manage their stress. I'm telling people to do that. But, but then again, they're spending all day indoors and then I'm bringing them into an indoor gym, right? So I started using the gym to talk to them about getting outside and walking and, and all that sort of thing. And it really helped. You know, I would have the doors open at the gym. But in Kentucky, I really can't have an outdoor gym. So I started looking at different properties, uh, you know, in Florida, in Mexico. And, and it just didn't really, I couldn't find anywhere that was actually affordable to, to be able to open a place. And then I found this place here in Nicaragua at a resort called Grand Pacifica and, and I have Nika, Nika Barbell. Uh, we're in the process. I've got selling some t-shirts and some mugs and it says get outside on the back. And the other t-shirt says don't be a zoo animal. Uh, so I'm in the process of selling t-shirts and raising some money to build a gym here. And I'll be able to build it for pennies on the dollar compared to what it would cost in the U.S., so we're, uh, I'm trying to, you know, we're, this is a great place here. Um, it's not perfect. No, it's perfect, but it's very affordable. It's very safe. The government pretty much lets you do your thing. One of the few governments that's told the WHO and the WEF to go rotate. Um, so, um, you know, if you mind your business here, you mind your own business and El Salvador is right down the road. So it's a great place to be. Um, so I'm building an outdoor gym here. There's a great community here with their, their, it's, building up there's a lot of expats here especially from canada so that's that's kind of my goal is to have to build a community here for people can come and focus on their health and live a more outdoor lifestyle and so what happened was when, when the beer bug hit uh you know kentucky locked down for a long period of time and and i was just like this is ridiculous and you know i'm i'm people are threatening to throw me in jail for telling them telling giving people advice you, you know i tell people you need to go outside you need to walk you need to get your sunshine you know this is ridiculous like wearing a diaper on your face is going to restrict your breathing and it's going to make your health worse and you know this is all common sense stuff right and people are calling for me to be thrown in prison because i'm kidding you know their grandma's going to die because of my advice i gave them and it's just you know insanity and so I saw this and then they were talking about making it mandatory for you to have to have certain, you know, shots in order for you to own a business in Kentucky. And I was just like, this is it. I'm out. So I moved down to Florida to the panhandle. I worked as an independent contractor there for a little while. I uh, was getting things going. And then the good Lord threw another challenge in my life. I got rear-ended by somebody who wasn't paying attention, a reckless driver. and I got hit from behind and uh, it was a huge, huge wake up call for me. And, uh, I was struggling to walk, struggling to talk. And so I was by myself in a town where I didn't know anybody. And, uh, it really sped the process up for me to work with Dr. Stillman. And so I, you know, I'd started working with Dr. Stillman, but I was still training people in person. So I was making a good chunk of my money from training kids in person and working at a gym in, in Santa Rosa beach. And it was good. It was starting to pick momentum was starting to get going, but then that accident happened. I couldn't work. I, I was, my vehicle was written off. I was down to a motorcycle. And when you have a head injury and you can barely talk, it's probably not a good idea to ride a motorcycle. So I was literally out in the middle of nowhere, like 35, 40 minutes from the nearest grocery store. I didn't know anybody. And it was, it was bad. It was a hard time in my life. And uh, so I just stuck to the basics. I crawled on my hands and knees and got out. I got out into the, uh, just into the sun. That was my goal. And then, uh, you know, with the help of Dr. Stillman and, and some of my friends and a lot of my clients from Kentucky, chipped in. And I, I mean, I was in such a bad place. I, I started a GoFundMe. I mean, that's how bad it was. It was. And uh, so uh, a lot of people supported me. I was very grateful for that. And then um, that's when I started, you know, working with Dr. Stillman and we started integrating coaching into what we're doing. Uh, because, you know, I, when I started working with Dr. Stillman, he, 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 uh, he didn't really realize how much 
reinforcement and how much it takes to make somebody change or change their lifestyle and change their behavior. You know, um, you know, he would like a typical medical doctor, he would check in with somebody and then talk to them again in three months. And, you know, um, he'd always be like, well, did you move on to the next lesson? We would have this curriculum. And I'm like, well, they haven't even done what we taught them in the first lesson. So we're not going to move on until they actually, you know, we have our five fundamental habits, which is get outside three times a day, walk outside three times a day after meals, eat a protein at every meal, drink high quality water, preferably spring water, get the lights off at night and then have a social life. You know, those are our five fundamental things. And those are the things we hammer with everybody. If you don't have those five things down, that that's your foundation of everything. We, there might be other things that are contributing, but that's really the thing that we really want to nail first. And, um, you know, we, time and time again, he'd be like, oh, so they haven't, you know, and it would take me a couple of weeks, a month or two to get people to buy in on the first two or two habits or so. And then all of a sudden they'd finally buy in and they'd be like, oh, I feel so much better. But, you know, why are we going to dump all this other stuff on people if they're not doing the basics, right? And so we really started integrating the coaching into um, into the, the medical practice and started getting incredible results. Uh, and then we started, we started a coaching program so we could work with more people. Cause I mean, you can't, you know, only the, we can only work with people in Florida and New York where we're licensed or where he's licensed and where, where our staff are licensed. And then that way with the coaching program, we can work with people from all over the world. And then the cool thing is, is a lot of people, you know, when we, we interview people, a lot of them are like, I don't need coaching. I know what I'm doing. And then they get into the coaching program and then they go realize, wow, this, this, I had no idea that they listened to somebody else, you know, me walk through somebody else through what they're going through. And they're like, I had no idea that was an issue for me. Or, you know, I had a drinking problem or I have, you know, I have an addiction to this or I've, I've got unresolved trauma from my past or they'll listen to somebody who went and did EMDR or they did neurofeedback and how much it helped them or, you know, they'll listen to somebody say, Hey, you know what? I used to think I was fine. And then I, you know, I finally realized that the stress was one of my biggest problems. And, um, I took my stress management seriously. And then all of a sudden I started to get better, you know, and you'll listen to people that are like, Oh, I, st I was here for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then all of a sudden, boom, I went up or, you know, I made great improvement and then I leveled out and then I had a little setback. And then I, you know, people don't, people just don't realize that life is kind of like, you know, everything's moving in a, in an up and down fashion. It's like, you don't make like straight up linear progress. It's kind of a, a wavy line, right? And so you got to be patient you got to be consistent. But a lot of people just chase shiny objects and they don't, you know, they don't, they don't uh, get the basics down and they don't really focus on those fundamentals. And so a lot of people just need the accountability and need somebody to talk them through it and walk them through it. You know, one of the reasons that I've so, uh, I think I'm so good at that is one, I've done really dumb things. So I can tell people, hey, don't worry, I've done way worse than that. And, you know, I was able to get through it and I'm able to, I'm able to relate to them too, because I'm like, I've been there, you know, I start feeling a little bit better. And then all of a sudden I hit the gas and I'm going hard again, you know, give me that ax. I'm going to cut down every tree in the forest. Right. And so I'm able to relate to people. And then I'm also to be able to relate to people that are in a really bad place that are either have let themselves go or are injured because I've been between some of my sports injuries and, you know, my car accident, you know, I was at a point where I could barely walk and talk. So I had to rehab myself back by myself with no help. So I know what it's like to like not be able to walk to, to, you know, to have trouble wiping my own butt, you know? Um, so I'm able to relate to all these different people, whether they're pushing performance or they've pushed performance and they've burned themselves out um, or they're in a really bad place and they've got to start really slow where they're at. I'm able to like, cause I've been in all those places and it's much easier to coach somebody when you've been in the situation that they're in. You know, so I, I, I have a, a, a wide array of experience in, in chicanery and stupidity. Um, so I'm able to, uh, to kind of relate to people on that. What I love about that story is, you know, a lot of people in the health space sort of give this air that, you know, they've never been sick and they, you know, they, they're always well and, and everything's great. And, you know, the reality is people who are in this space are the ones that have had the most difficulties and they have to find the answers in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I feel, yeah. I feel the same way. I'm just like you. I've done so many stupid things and, um, you know, thank God I, I did them relatively early in my life because um, I've, 
I feel like I've put myself on the right track earlier than than most. And right. uh, you know, you re, your your story reminds me of um, something I heard Paul Check talk about, which is getting as much experience from broad from uh, you know a lot of different things. It helps you relate to people from all walks of life. You know, Paul talks about you know he's years boxing and he was he he can he's a plumber as well and I think he did mm-hmm. tree tree logging and all of these different different experiences help you communicate complex ideas to people from all walks of life and I think that's where um, I certainly look up to you in that way and I know Dr Stillman has always spoken to me uh, about your ability to convey things to people that he struggles to do. Uh, and you seem to be able to do it effortlessly. Uh, and I, I, I think that's so important. And there's so many people out there who, you know, need, they don't need a doctor so much. They need someone who's relatable, who understands what they're going through and can help right. guide them to do the basics, just the fundamental stuff, just lay right. the foundation. Uh, it's that 80-20 principle where if you do 20% of the most important stuff, you take care of 80% of the problem. And that's, yep. that echoes back to what you were saying then, you know, just managing things, basic things like stress, you know, how, how simple is that um, and how much, how much uh, gain you can get from that is incredible. And in, the, in uh, the Body That Keeps the Score, he talks about, and this was the, the thing that really made me realize how important this is. He talks about, um, I think it was Vietnamese immigrants in California after the Vietnam War who were coming into the ophthalmologist saying that they were blind. The ophthalmologist would check their eyes and their eyes looked perfectly normal, but they were clinically blind because their body basically after the war said, I've seen too much. I don't want to see anymore. And their brain just shut that part of of the functioning down. And like you said, uh, autoimmune disease, he writes in the book about people who have issues with themselves and who they are it's no wonder that their immune system gets confused and and starts going after their own cells, you know. And I think that's that sits at some the heart of a lot of people's problems is just these really basic things about your relationship with yourself and the people around you. And this is so often skipped over by people in the health space. And it really is the core. It's like the roots of the tree. Uh, if you don't have that, you can't support anything that you try and build on top of that. It doesn't matter how good your diet is, how great your exercise regime is if you can't if you can't have those basics to build on things are going to fall over very quickly yeah if you can't love yourself and have a good relationship with yourself and who you are you're not going to have a good relationship with others um <clears throat> and and it's just uh, you have to be able i think silence is the most overlooked thing you know, obviously, I, I think circadian rhythm and getting outside and, and living an outdoor lifestyle is the foundation of health. And I think it's one of the reasons why people are um, really struggling today. But I also think right there with being outside in nature is silence. It says, be still and know. I mean, I'm not an ultra religious guy, but I mean, I've, I've definitely read the Bible backwards. I probably read Psalms every other month, like straight through. Uh, it has one of my favorite Bible verses, which is it's better to sit on the corner of a rooftop than live with a quarrelsome woman. Of course, you can put person in there instead of woman, but it's one of my favorite Bible verses of all time. But, um, you know, it says, be still and know that I am God. And Jesus himself would go off into the mountains by himself to sit in silence. Okay. And if it's that important for Jesus to go out and be in silence, how important is it for us? Um, the world, the modern world has taken silence from us. And silence, I think, is when the body kind of regurgitates and resets the hard drive. And people just don't, that's what I love about here. You know, like people, they work hard, they do a lot of manual labor, but they'll take breaks where they're taking, an, it's so hot in the afternoon, they'll, they'll go lay down in the shade or in a hammock and they'll just take a nap or they'll just sit quietly. The end of the day, they'll, they'll sit with their family and they'll eat. You know, like I went for dinner this afternoon. It took me 30 minutes to get my dinner and I didn't care. I just relaxed and, and observed. And there was like chickens running around and little kids. And the culture here is just so laid back, right? And our modern culture, we're literally, it's like I tell people all the time, it's kind of like you're sitting in your car revving the engine 
full blast and you're not driving anywhere, right? And then people wonder why they're exhausted. And then they, they, you know, they're like all day, they've been revving their vehicle, revving their vehicle, revving their vehicle. And then they, uh, they try to go, they try to go work out and it's like, they're emotionally and physically exhausted. And then they go and try and work out on top of that. You know, I, I, a lot of people will poo poo the aura, aura ring. And uh, I like it because you can wear it in airplane mode. Some people will say that they don't like it because it emits some light, which, okay, sure. It emits a little bit of light. I was working with a lady who had been to just about every high level functional medicine doctor, expert, paid thousands and thousands of dollars. No one could tell her why she was exhausted. <clears throat> I spent five minutes with her and this lady sounded like a chipmunk. I mean, she literally was like a machine gun. She was just, I was like, you need to slow down. So I made her get an aura ring. Right. And I like it because you can wear it in airplane mode, but for some people, it's going to show you the data. And if, even if they just wear it for a few weeks, so they can just kind of become aware of how much stress they're under. So there's a setting, Aura has a resiliency thing now and it has a whole bunch of different settings. But before, if you clicked on heart rate, it would have like a restorative time daily, right? So we went in there. Not only did she have a high respiratory rate, which means you're over breathing, which means you're under a lot of stress. We went in and looked at her, 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 uh, her she wore it for a couple months and we went in and looked at her restorative time. We scrolled back for like four months. She didn't have one minute of restorative time in four months. Not one minute. And she had gotten all these labs and spent all this money and all that. We don't know why we can't tell why you feel so terrible. And that one data point, once she started like, okay, let's start off with getting you to five minutes of restorative time every day. And she's like, started doing that. She's like, oh, I've been getting five minutes. I've been getting 10 minutes. She started getting up to half an hour. Report. She's like, I feel so amazing. And then she'd call me in two weeks and go, I don't know what's going on. I don't feel, I don't feel good. And we checked the ring. She's like zero restorative time. Well, you know, I've got overwhelmed and, and I started working too much. And then I, you know, then I, I, I started staying up and I started having a couple glasses of wine. I started watching TV. Oh, I, you got to get back to restorative time. And it's that same thing. And with the clients I trained for 20 years, it'd be the same thing. They'd be doing well. And then all of a sudden, well, you know, I've had a lot of stress lately. I've been fighting with my wife and so I've had a couple beers in the garage to make me feel better. And then, it, you know, I don't sleep as good. I get up the night and pee a couple times when I have two or three beers and I haven't slept well for four or five nights. And then I start snacking on Doritos and then maybe I have a brownie and I've gained a little bit of weight. Oh, okay. So you need to start walking again. You need to get outside. You need to cut the beers back. You know, it's, just, it, you know, it's constantly reminding people of the basic fundamentals and the ring is a really good way to remind people, hey, like, okay, your respiratory rate's going up. You need to make more effort to get outside. You need to make more effort to put the tongue in the roof of your mouth, breathe through your nose. So it's a really good way for like type A people to have some self-awareness. Um, so, you know, I get people like that all the time. They're on HRT, they're on peptides, they're doing all these things. And no one's really like grabbed the 200-pound gorilla in the room, which is like, okay, you've got a respiratory rate of 17. Your HRV is 10. And then you're trying to add more fuel to the tank by putting peptides and hormones into your system when you don't know the how, how to chill out and you don't know how to relax. So, you know, you can continue to push the throttle down, but until we actually pull your car into the shop and fix it in the garage, you're going to end up having a big problem, right? And so a lot of people need the data to see that. And a lot of people can't feel it because they just, they just push harder and push harder because they're so used to driving exhausted. A lot of people need to see data to to fix that, right? So, mm. and yeah, because the data right. doesn't the data doesn't lie. Like you know, when you have a seventeen respiratory rate, like you, there's no excuse for that, you know. So, yeah, and and silence and stillness is something that you're right. We've we've almost completely lost in the modern world. You know, everywhere you're going, you're you you're listening to a podcast. Or, you know, you're you're watching a video while you eat or. Uh, you name it. There's always something to keep your mind running, and you know I, I'm I'm a victim of this as well. I have to rem remind myself when I go for a walk to not download any podcasts and just to walk and to not just give myself an hour where nothing is uh, you know going through my mind, nothing is you know occupying my thoughts, um, and you know sometimes I'm resistant to that because I'm like, well, that's an hour I could be using to like listen to something interesting and learn. But you have to realize that silence is equally important 
you know, you can't just be trying to learn and fill your mind up with stuff all the time because, like you said, you're going to reach a tipping point. Your your stress bathtub is going to overfill, and you 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 need to give yourself time to empty it. And this is something that's lost on a lot of people, I think. And they, like you said, the the, the burnout thing is is uh, very very big today, particularly in women. I, I think um, I think we could both agree that um, they just they have a tendency to to not stop and to think that if there's any time spent doing uh, little to, like you said, empty that empty that tub, it's seen as a waste of time. And I think we need to we need to change the change the way we look at downtime, change the way we look at prioritizing silence, even if it's just um, you know saying the rosary. Um, it's incredibly um, you know even if you're not particularly religious, just say the rosary because it's going to slow your respiratory rate down. It's going to take your mind off things. It's going to get get you to focus on something that's not normally a part of what you're doing. And, and it's just sort of detached from your, from your life in a sense. Um, and I think this is something that conventional medicine is just completely, um, you know, inadequate, inadequately uh, dealing with, um, what do you see as the things in conventional medicine that plague the people that you see most? Uh, what what was conventional medicine missing or getting wrong the most? Um, that people well, I, I would say circadian about? rhythm, circadian biology. Period. You know, yep. like there's no no emphasis on light. Uh, you know, also just covering up symptoms. You know, there's there's no there's no education on lifestyle change or even in. You know, you look at uh, you look at uh, natural or integrative medicine. They just do the same thing, yeah. but with supplements, right? Yeah. Um, you know, where we're what we do with what I do with Dr. Stillman is about okay, the supplements are a tool, uh, and there's people that'll say, well, we don't need supplements at all, and you know, all you need is enough sun and just move closer to the equator, which you know does help in some ways. There's mm -hmm. our people. There's people that can't do that, right? Um. <laughs> You know, our our thing is like, look, let's let's check off as many of these low hanging fruit things as we can, and then if we need, if we can use supplements to speed the process up, or we want to make sure it's targeted, we're not just throwing shit against the wall, right? Um, but we want to have a foundation of fundamentals so that we actually improve overall health instead of getting focused on a specific disease or disorder. We're focusing on overall health and well-being in general, right? Instead of because a lot of people get married to their disease, you know, they mm. have they they it literally becomes their identity, right? And and they get super obsessed and focused on whether it's Lyme disease or chronic fatigue or whatever it is. Well, let's get focused on building like building resiliency and like teaching you that hey, if you start getting outside and getting sunshine, you start walking every day, you start giving yourself better nutrition. We're going to make you more resilient. We're going to make it so that your body can defeat this thing that you have. Right? We're going to improve your redox potential, which basically is like you know increasing your stress bathtub. Um, so that's kind of the attitude that we really try and. Um, adhere and give people. And then, then it's about educating people on trade-offs, right? Okay. So you want to do X, you want to do Z. All right. Well, have this benefit. There might be this, you know, there might be this side effect. Everything has a price, right? Mm -hmm. And really what Dr. Stillman and I do, okay. So you want to be a hard charger and you want to push, well, it might affect your longevity, right? You know, so educating people like, okay, so you want to live as long as possible. Well, you probably don't want to be a high level performer. You want to be a, you want to flirt with performance. You don't want to marry it. Okay. Okay. So you want to be able to like, you know, throw your wife over your shoulder and carry her up the stairs until the day you die. Well, you're probably going to die a little younger. Right. So a lot of it is just get educating people on like, I'm not going to live to 90 something years old. Like it's like my, I'm 5'10, I'm 250 pounds, I'm lean, but I've got a shit ton of muscle mass. I, you know, I still lift heavy things. I've abused my body in a million different ways. I think the lifestyle changes that I've made will help with my longevity. And I don't know if I'd want to live that long with the way I've, you know, driven my body like a stolen car, right? I feel pretty good. I just turned 49. Um, but, you know, I definitely don't want to be a decrepit old guy. I'm going to definitely slow down. I've started doing things like Tai Chi, which is the complete opposite. You know, I'm a, I'm a top fuel dragster. I think that's the other thing people don't understand either, even in, in medicine, 
they think everybody can do the same things and everybody, you know, uh, one, it's a one size fits all. My body type is very different than Dr. Stillman's, right? I'm built a certain, I'm built more like a top field dragster. Dr. Stillman's more of like a, I'd call him like a, a Lexus or like maybe a, uh, like a, like a, like a, like a Toyota Avalon or something like that, you know? Um, that's the way he's, he's never going to be able to lift really heavy things. He's a decent athlete. He's better at rotational sports. He's better at moving than I am, but I'm better at like seek and destroy. Like I'm kind of like the guy from X-Men that runs through the walls, like the juggernaut. That's kind of the way I'm built. So not understanding different people's structure and, um, that different people have different, like if you look at like Olympic swimmers, they all look the same, right? Uh, same with sprinters. they will be the short stocky guys and then they will be the Hussein Bolts, but they all pretty much look the same. And that's just because that body type is really good activity. So I think a lot of times people will think, well, running is good for everybody. No, it's not. <laughs> Some people are just not yeah. good at running and it's probably going to make them worse, right? So tailoring your advice to the person that you're dealing with like is a is a big factor but um but i think i just think conventional medicine has just just basically gotten into symptom management right it's amazing at you know if, if like if i get a head injury or i break an arm or like i'm bleeding out on the side of the road like put me in a helicopter and fly me to the best er right they'll, they'll keep me from dying but as far as like teaching people to get better and, and, you know, avoid, you know, having a diaper when they're 80 years old. Uh, I mean, it does a horrible job of that quality of life and life expectancy is crashing in the West and the amount of money we spend on medicine is insane. Right. So, but integrative medicine isn't much better because they really don't, most people in integrative medicine don't really get after the lifestyle change. They just teach, they just chase like, you know, um, a lot of detox protocols or parasite cleanses and, and those things have, have their place. But we see a lot of people that aren't in a very good place that do those things. And it just absolutely wrecks them instead mm -hmm. of focusing on like the basic fundamental things and getting people in a better place, you know, putting people on all these different cleanses and stuff that that can be just as harmful as some of the stuff that's being done in conventional medicine, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, Mirrors exactly what I see. You know, I work in a hospital. It's kind of ground zero for for what you were just talking about. And, um, you know, I always think if you take the prescription pad away from the doctors that I work with, they got nothing. They have absolutely nothing to work with. And, you know, it's funny to me how many um, vegetarian Indians come in. And, you know, because I get to see all their labs, you know, they all have like the worst diabetes I've ever seen. They have extremely elevated triglycerides. And they're all thin, so they they don't have that much excess adiposity. Skinny and fat, the skin, worst they, kind they of are, fat. They are the classic um, skinny fat um, type two diabetic Indians. Vegetarian, been vegetarian their whole life, never eaten a piece of meat in their entire life, um, and they all. Well, and, and two gener two generations ago, they weren't like that. No, it's because they've moved indoors. They're now and doing I, Google jobs. You took the word, you know? words out of my mouth. You know, they all work indoors and the vast majority of them work on computers all day long. And, you know, I, I try and explain, you know, I, I've seen patients, particularly women, you know, the, the lifelong vegetarians never had a piece of meat in their life. And, you know, they have three kids in the space of three years, uh, you know, which is just like completely sapping your body. Um, you know, you shouldn't... You, you should be very careful doing that, even if you are on the most nutrient dense diet there is. And then you've got, you know, them coming in after, you know, they've got three young kids and they they're on prednisone. And, you know, you you ask them, you know, how how often do you get outside? Well, I don't really get outside. And I, and I have to show them, you know, look at the color of my skin compared to yours. You know, your skin is way darker than mine, which means it needs way more light than mine. And, you know, you're on prednisone and Guess what the guess what UV light does from the sun? It choreographs the immune response. It suppresses it slightly. It's like nature's low-grade prednisone all the time, and you need that more than everyone else. You know, it's no surprise you've ended up here. And you know, most of the time, actually, almost all of the time, that kind of story falls on deaf ears because it kind of just goes against the paradigm of what what they're there for. Um, and essentially what they're there for is for someone to tell them, here's here's what's wrong. Here's the pill that's going to mediate that reaction. 
and I'll like you said, and I'll see you in three months, and and we'll reassess then when things get worse. We'll up the dose or we'll switch drugs. And you know, this is this is just completely polar opposite to what you guys are doing. And like you said, you're fostering resilience. And when you foster resilience, you basically become your own doctor. <clears throat> you know, nothing's smarter than your own body. Your body knows what to do if you give it the right tools. And, you know, this is this is why I really like what you and Dr. Stillman are doing because you're actually helping people um, make you redundant. Um, that's the goal. And it's a weird business model, but it's one that has to happen if people want to get healthy. I, I agree. It's a weird business model. But, and here's the big difference between Dr. Stillman and I is we'll actually meet people where they are. Mm. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll give them, we'll, we'll, and there's some people that need a shake and need like a come to Jesus meeting. And, and I'll do that for people, but we'll actually meet people. Like you have somebody that's in a, been in an office for 30 years, right? Like just, just start with going outside three times a day for five minutes. Just start with that, you know? And, and once they buy in, you know, most people are not going to like totally change their life like I did, right? But part of the reason I was staring death in, in the face, that's a big part of it. Uh, but we'll meet people where they are and we'll just start with a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. And we kind of handheld, we handhold people uh, a fair amount, which some people don't. And and everybody's got their own style. So that's totally fine. And we need that. It's like, I compare it like Baptist fire and brimstone minister to like, you know, somebody who's a little more laid back. There's a different kind of a coach and approach. Like some people need to be like, slapped in the face and like shook and be like, you got to make a change or you're going to die tomorrow. Right. Yeah, yeah. Some people need sternness and some people need a hug and they need to be able to cry and then you need to get them on their feet. So we're somewhere in the middle there and it depends. I'm able to kind of change my personality according to who I'm working with. And, you know, you said something before that I, I, I tell you what, if you want to be a coach, do as many things as you can. I mean, I've bounced in nightclubs. I worked at a five star hotel in Aspen. I did high-end security bodyguard work all over the world. Um, I worked in an elementary school. I was a strength, you know, I worked in, in schools. I worked at a place called Canadian Tire. I worked in the oil rigs. I, I mean, I have worked in every job you could possibly imagine. Just about anyone I talk to, I at least know like more or less what their country's like. I might know one city in their country. I kind of know a little bit about the history of their country and I'm able to at least talk to somebody or if I'm on a call, I'll look up the person where they're from. And if I've never been there, I'll look it up on Google and at least read a little bit about it so I can get, I can ask them a question about it and at least get some like, you know, I love Australian rules football. You know, it's, I love, it's such a violent sport. It's amazing. <laughs> and so, you know, Aussie rules is one of my favorite, my favorite things. And, you know, and I, I'm from a Commonwealth country. So when I talk to, you know, South Africans and Aussies and New Zealanders, and we can talk rugby world cup and all that kind of stuff. And it, it really gets, gets, you know, gets people excited. Um, but my dad is, is a fine example of the modern medical system. You know, he was a night shift worker, got colitis. They put him on pregnizone. He gained a bunch of weight, no dietary changes. They never talked about, Hey, you might want to stop working night shift. Then he ends up with a colostomy, colostomy bag. You know, then he's, you know, on diabetes medication and I tried to help him with that. And of course they recommended uh, six to eight servings of fruits uh, and bread and rice a day as a, as a type two diabetic. And, and, you know, it just kept getting worse and worse. Like, you know, okay, you know, up the, up the metformin, you know, then you're on insulin and, and, you know, no talk of, of managing, getting outside, you know, doing some strength training you know, maybe let's, uh, maybe let's cut back on those refined carbohydrates just a little bit, like, you know? Mm -hmm. So my dad is, is a prime example of somebody in the modern medical system that just, you know, onto the next drug, onto the next, you know, no resetting of lifestyle, no, uh, you know, Hey, you know, you've got a diabetes and you've had your half your freaking colon, you've had your colon removed. You might want to stop working night shift, you know? Mm. But no, I'll I'll continue to eat pizza at three o'clock in the morning and Chinese food at three o'clock in the morning on night shift, you know. Um, so yeah. luckily, I didn't go down that path. But um, yeah, yeah, we're just trying to really help encourage people to be their own. Uh, and I did that the same in my gym too. You know, I I really wanted to educate people on 
teaching them how to train and making sure they weren't going to be like a slave to me, so to speak. But the majority of the people that I had trained for 20 years because they liked the fact that I made it simple for them and I helped guide them and I helped give them accountability. It was more of a mentorship type relationship. And we deal with that a lot, you know, in, in Dr. Stillman's, um, you know, in our practice, a lot of people love coming to the calls to listen to what other people have to say. And then they also just love having rational people that get on a call and have a good discussion because there's just so many people that are like to try and find somebody that can have a reasonable discussion. Like even if we agree to disagree on something, we can at least present each side. You know, I might even, this is something I do. I will pick the other side of the argument just to see how people react. Like if I'm talking to somebody and they seem really dug into their opinion, I'll just all of a sudden flip it and take the other argument just to mm. see if they're going to personally attack me and, and call me a lunatic. You know, I'll just do that. I'll, whether it's vaccines or whatever it is, the topic, I'll take the opposite argument just to see how they handle it. And if they can have a reasonable discussion with me based on point by point argument and not make it personal, then I know that's somebody I can trust. But if they can't have a debate with me and disagree with me, if they go right for the like, you're a clown, you're a loser, or whatever, call me whatever you want then I know I can't trust that person. So I'll do that on purpose sometimes just to see what kind of person I'm dealing with. I'll pick the opposite argument just to see what's going on. And it's good for me too. I think everybody should be able to argue both sides of an argument. Um, I mean, we used to do that in school when I was growing up. You would have to take both sides and you'd have to argue each side. Um, you know, that that's how you critically think. And that has been taken away from us too. I mean, we could do a whole show on critical thinking and the zombieization of, of, of people, particularly children. It's just downright scary. Yeah, I mean, logic and critical thinking um, should be at the forefront. I mean, this is something that I've been thinking so much about recently is, you know, clearly our health has shifted dramatically over the last 100 years. We know it's not genetic because genetics don't work that fast. So we know it's environment. And I think if, if our health has shifted so much over the last century, shouldn't our investigations start at the question of what have the biggest environmental shifts been over the last 100 years? Let's look into those first. And of course, they are, then it's so bad that doctors don't even realize that those shifts are a problem at all. You know, the, the fact that we've moved indoors, the fact that we're bathed in electromagnetic um, energy, I mean, that's not even seen is that, you know, they would say, well, that doesn't have any impact on health at all. So I, I think there's this, just this um, chasm between um, the, the medical side of things and what's actually going on uh, with the environment and how the environment is shaping our health. And well, all the data is there. They're just choosing to ignore it. Yeah. Look, well, look at Great, Great Britain. Look at they have people are not going out in the sun in Great Britain. They are covering themselves in tarps. The more they avoid the sun, the higher the skin cancer rates go. Shouldn't that be like a huge like ding, 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 ding? Oh, guess what? Everyone all over the world is spending more time inside in air-conditioned homes and less time outside. Oh, blood pressure rates are going up everywhere in the world. Oh, India now has the highest rate of diabetics in the world. Oh, ding, ding, ding. That might be that might be a little like alarm, but no, people just they they don't think that way, and it's uh, you know it's it's just hard. For, and and you've got people like uh, our boy Billy Boy and 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 some of the other wonderful psychopaths that are like, we're going to block the sun for climate change. Like, oh, really? That's a really good idea. Let's block the sun. Like, let's. Let's take out like the most important thing. On the, I mean, I, I don't get involved in the climate change debate. I mean, climate is changing constantly. Like we've we've had so many extreme climate changes in, in history. It's insane. Um, but as a Canadian, as someone who grew up in the Arctic, you better pray it's global warming. Because God forbid you mess up the sun and you take out too much sun. I'll tell you what, minus 40, 50 degrees uh, Celsius is not fun. And mm. it only takes a little bit of dust in the atmosphere to dramatically change the climate. And global warming, it's always easier to deal with a little bit warmer climate than it is to deal with, you know, minus 50 degrees Celsius. Oh, gosh. 
I'm, uh, what's I'm the glad. coldest, what's the coldest you've ever experienced? Um, I've been to, I've been to Scandinavia in winter. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was quite mild. I think the coldest day we were there was minus two. Um, okay. But prior, C- prior Celsius? to me, Celsius. Celsius. Okay, that's that's not that's not cold. That's so not cold. Prior to that, I mean, Sydney in winter at night might get to like two, maybe. Okay. So so where I'm from in Edmonton, it'll be minus forty degrees Celsius, which. It's cold, but without a wind, it's actually not that bad. With a wind chill, it's horrible, but you can take a boiling pot of water outside in 40 below. Boiling, like boiling. And throw it up in the air, and it'll turn to snow instantly. See, I'm instantly. glad I've never experienced that before. Um, but, Sydney and, is- and here's the thing. When, when it's 40 below with a wind, you'll see people walking backwards down the street. Because if you walk head on into 40 below with a wind, it'll collapse your lungs. That was something I noticed in Scandinavia was that I, I found it very, very difficult to breathe through my nose because it was so damn cold. I had to breathe through my mouth all the time. And of course, well, I'm, you've I'm got riding to slow, my bike all over. Yeah, and, you've got to slow your breathing right down and you've got to breathe as little as you possibly can. And your nose will actually, if you breathe too much, your nose will actually freeze. Um, yep, we've, you know, I've had it. my eyelashes freeze together. It's really funny. Uh, you know, I'm here in Nicaragua and I have a, I have a housekeeper and she's, she's great. I mean, I had to show her how to turn her washer on. She'd never seen a washing machine before. And, uh, oh man, this, I, hopefully I won't mess things up, but you gotta let's check this. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Uh, check this sun, sunset out. Can you see that? You see I'm that? So, right? I'm so jealous of you, Jim. I, I want to be there with you now. Oh, you can come stay anytime you want, man. I've got an upstairs bedroom. You're more than welcome. Uh, come hang out. Um, it's probably a good thing I got that girl out of there before the yeah. You get more views that way. <laughs> but yeah, I don't, but, uh, I don't think I've told you, but I um I'll be moving to Sweden this year, so uh, we'll oh, be a little bit closer. Okay. okay. Well, I tell you what, you can fly probably to Panama City and then to here, uh, but you're more than welcome to come anytime. Um, we're about to enter the rainy season here, which is just monsoon rain, like two hours every day. Yeah. But it's funny, my housekeeper, <clears throat> she, it, it rarely gets below, so what's 70 degrees Fahrenheit Celsius? <sighs> so it rarely gets, oh, what's, so what's, what's your average summer day in Australia? How many, Cel- I can't remember Celsius. Oh, uh, mid 30s, 30s. Okay, so 30 is hot, 20s. right? It's 30 is hot, right? 30 is hot, but we get you we get 40 plus in summer. Okay, okay, okay. So 40 would be like 100 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Is that about right? Yeah, prob- probably a little bit more than 100, I think. Okay, okay. Yeah. So so it's in the 30 high 30s here. It's you know 97, you know. Yeah. A couple couple months weeks ago, it got down in the 70s, which I would say the 20s here, which is pretty pretty chilly for here. Yeah. Right. Which would be like seventy degrees in the in the states. Well, she's driving her motorcycle here at like six o'clock in the morning. The sun comes up here at five. Comes up, it starts peaking over at five o'clock, and then by uh, five thirty, it's full up. My I have solar panels on my house, and it literally the solar panels are starting to rock at like five thirty. So. Um, She's describing to me because she's driving in in the morning and she's doing about, I don't know, probably 60 kilometers an hour, right? And so that drops the temperature by several degrees for every 10 kilometers an hour. So she's probably, she's probably driving, she's driving 60 kilometers an hour, say it's 20. She's probably, that's probably five degrees Celsius for her. And she's describing like frostbite symptoms, like, you know, tingling fingers, like painful fingers, like turning pink and red. And I'm like, that's frostbite. And she goes, oh yeah. She's like freezing and they've all got like parkas on and stuff. And it's crazy because it's like, you know, it's literally like summertime in Canada. Yeah. But they've just never experienced that. It's just really, really interesting. It was just, it was fun listening to her talk about it. But, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's great. The, the, the people here are absolutely wonderful. 
I, I can get a, a like I had a Churrasco, which is like a flat iron steak. Uh, you can get filet mignon here for seventeen U.S. dollars. Like wow, grass grass fed. Like it, there's no such thing as non organic here. I know we got dance party going on in the background, here, so <laughs> they just can't afford. They can't afford the chemicals here. It's great, but like all the seafood is fresh from a place called Masha Chapa. I literally eat filet or uh, churrasco, which is like a flat iron, flathead steak every single day. And it's, it's all from the local farmers here. And it's just, the food is so simple. It's, 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 it's amazing. So I love it's it. It's a di- different way of life down there. Um, it is. It's called Nika time. Uh, and I love it. I, I love the fact that it's so laid back. Um, and I mean, it's just, there's no street lights anywhere. I'm actually going to be going to, uh, my, my neighbors are, uh, are Canadian. And they moved down here to get away from the insanity. Yeah. And uh, they've lived here for like a year. And there's a restaurant about 15 minutes down the road that has mini golf, dollar mini golf and dollar tacos. And she raises all her like chicken tacos and, and you know, a po- pollo, it's called pollo. It's Spanish for chicken. And then they have, uh, you know, beef is, is uh, de carne. And so they have beef tacos, shrimp tacos, and the, the chicken... She actually raises her own chicken for her restaurant. So you see her like pull the chicken out of the fridge or the freezer and she's chopping it all up and making it. And then like if you have a cocktail like a margarita, she actually picks the limes off the tree to make your margarita. The tacos are a dollar, which is like 30, 36 Cordoba, like one US dollar for a taco. So I'll have six or eight tacos and <laughs> margaritas like I think a shot or and I'm not a big drinker, but I think a shot of rum is is a dollar here. They make they have they make their own rum here in Nicaragua. And uh, but even like the fast food is different. Like Coca Cola, I've had one just to have one, and it's just sugar cane with like food coloring in it. Like it, it's a totally different taste, and it doesn't have all that chemical aftertaste. Like there's only one or two ingredients. There's not seventy million different mm. things behind it. Um, so even the junk food here is just. I'll eat a, well, you know, I'm closer to the equator so I can get away with more, but the pizza here, I'll eat a whole pizza. And if I ate a whole pizza in the US, it would it would give me a problem. But here, not a problem at all. Tell me, tell me about the gym. I, I wanna I wanna know more. Yeah. Um, particularly sure. uh, maybe you can give a bit of background as to why you think it's so important that gyms are outdoors and uh, and connected yeah. with the cycles of the day. Yeah, I mean, if anything, you want to have at least a gym where you're getting natural light. And you're not yeah. baking under, you know, blue light is, is you know, we, we've, we've, we don't understand that this full spectrum light is so important and getting different light at different times of the day. Like right now I'm getting red, you know, the sun is ramping down and it's calming, um, this is a healing part of the spectrum. It also builds your soul callus in the evening. You're getting different spectrums of light. And a lot of the, the spectrums of life, the light, the, the most important you can't see, right? And what's happened is in order to make things more efficient, they've taken out red, they've taken out green, they've taken away these other colors that are so important. Um, and it's just blue. And blue raises cortisol. It makes you alert. And it's great. That's great first thing in the morning. But you need the other parts of the spectrum to basically do their thing as well. And, um, you know, so if you're baking under blue light all day, you're, you're, you're messing your insulin levels up, your uh, cortisol levels, you're, you know, you're just, you're not getting the right message in your brain and for your hormones to function properly. And uh, you're just out of line with your circadian rhythm. And if you type in circadian rhythm and cancer, circadian rhythm and heart attack, I mean, you type in circadian rhythm and it's pretty much linked to anything, everything. You, you'll you see study after study after study linking your circadian rhythm to every kind of cancer you can imagine. Um, every kind of disease has a major link to circadian biology. And they don't, you know, they don't talk about it at all. You know, they, they, you, you can, they can predict a child's mental health by how much time they spent in nature growing up. 
you know, like the kids are all running around climbing freaking palm trees here. And like, I was just at a restaurant that's just outside the, just outside the gate here. The little girl was running around chasing chickens all over the place in her bare feet, and like falling over and like picking up the chicken. And like, you know, she was, it, kids are allowed to be kids here and they live a more outdoor life. So it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful. But if, especially if you're living in, a, if you're in an office all day, like take a smoke break, but take a sun break instead. Get outside, get your eyes in the light, you know, get outside multiple times a day. Let your brain know what time of day it is. You know, and and the same thing is for the gym. Like, as much as you can do it, you need to get outside as much as you can. And so that that's been you know one of my passions is to to make it so that people can work outside. Like even the gym I I work out in Villa de Carmen, it's indoors, but they don't have any artificial lights. Like they don't turn lights on here because the electricity is so expensive, right? So it's not necessarily in direct sunlight, but there's no fake lights in there. Yeah. So yeah. you know. I mean, my gym is going to be under a palapa because you don't want to work out here at 2 o'clock in the afternoon in the direct sun. So it's going to be under a roof. There's going to be some equipment outside for, you know, in the mornings and stuff like that. But it's going to be naturally lit. Um, but I, I think it's just so important to spend as much time outside as you can. And you might not be able to work out directly outside, but you want to be walking outside. You want to be doing the best you can to do like I do like this podcast out here in the middle of this outdoor restaurant, right? Um, I do all my work on my patio. I have a Pepsters patio. I have a kitchen that opens up to the outside. Most people, particularly today, can at least like at least eat outside. Like I, when I was in Lexington, you know, it would be 70 to 70, it would be 20 degrees, 23 degrees, beautiful out. And there'd be people waiting in line for a seat inside when they could just sit outside, you know, I, I did it. I did an experiment where I took my blood sugar after I ate a stack of pancakes, um, sitting in my underwear and fake light uh, in my gym and then sitting outside in the sun. And it was dramatically, my blood sugar was dramatically lower with sunshine. So there's a reason why all these Europeans are doing a lot better because they, most of them eat outside, you know, they they, their food is much simpler uh, they don't have a lot of the garbage in the food like we do here, but a big part of it is they walk a lot and they spend a lot of time outdoors. You know, so at the very least, get more natural light in your life and get less fake light in your life and get those lights off at night. Get outside for five, 10 minutes, even if you can crack your window when you're driving to work, you know, like do what you can. Um, it's, it's, it's critical. It's, it's absolutely critical. So that's one of the reasons. And, and I'm, I'm self, I'm being selfish. I want to have. I want to have a place for me to work out here. <laughs> and then yeah. I want to make sure that we have things for my fellow gringos to do. Cause like a friend of mine who lives in Panama, who came here, he's from uh, Austria. He was talking about how he moved to Panama several years ago and he moved to a very remote place. And he was like, I built the gym here. So gringos wouldn't complain as much because when, uh, you know, gringos are bored, they tend to complain. So part of it is for me, selfish reasons. I one, I want to be able to not have to drive 40 minutes down the road to go to a gym. And two, I want to be able to train people when they come visit here. I want to be able to work with them in person. Uh, and then I also want people, you know, that want to move here uh, to have more activities and more things to do. Because there's a lot of cool things to do here, but it is a developing, you know, I would say this place is like Costa Rica in 1960 or 1970. It's still, you know, it's still a third world country here. Um, incredibly safe. It's the safest country in Central America. Um they have actually a really decent medical program here. Um, 50 bucks to go see a doctor. Very affordable. The roads are decent, but it's still a third world country. So it's still developing. So there's still a lot of amenities that, uh, especially out here where we are in the middle of nowhere. So I'm really looking forward to getting that going. And you can go to nikabarbell.com. You can get yourself a t-shirt from the back. It says, get outside. It says, don't be a zoo animal. You can get a coffee mug. Uh, I think, I do believe they have... Um, they have you can you can get it in Australia. I think you can. I haven't had anyone order from Australia yet, but it's Printify. I think they have places in Australia that do it. Um, so, but even not, you can buy the gym a cup of coffee. I put if you go to nikabarbell.com, there's an opportunity if you don't want to order merchandise, just buy the gym a cup of coffee, and it goes a long way here. You know, for I've sponsored the local baseball team. I put a roof on a lady's house. I've I've helped out with some of the school kids, and for just a small amount of money can go a long way. So not only is it for developing the gym, 
but I'm also going to be using the proceeds from the t-shirts and all that to, to also help locals here. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people here that need help and they're so grateful just for little things. Like they're, they're so, like we had the power go out today for a couple hours, but nothing changes here because most people here don't even have, they might have one light bulb in their house and they might have maybe sometimes some of them have Wi-Fi, uh, or they charge their phone but they don't spend a lot of time on their phones. They're usually working or doing whatever, but most of them have gas stoves or clay ovens and they, most of them wash their clothes by hand. So the power goes out here. Nothing really changes much. Yeah. I'll have to be the first Aussie to, um, to get a t-shirt. Um, I really love the message on the back. Um, yeah. 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 Don't be a, don't be a zoo. I got, don't be a zoo animal and I got get outside. So yeah, I sorry. tell that I'll tell that to the people at uh, at the hospital all the time, you know, trying to explain to them uh, that we're all yeah. You could or you could have your "Don't be a zoo animal" coffee mug. Yeah, that's a good one too. I'll have to get both. I'll I'll rep you. Yeah. I'll rep you on the other side well, of the world. I, pre- for sure. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I'll have to see. Like you'll have to let me know if it's if it's good in Australia or not. I haven't had anybody. I haven't had any Aussies or Kiwis or or Springboks uh, buy anything yet. So. I'll um I'll be the first to let you know. Well, I appreciate that. So, uh, Jim, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. I always learn a lot um, speaking to you, and I'm always um, captured by how much wisdom you've got. It makes me want to go out and do more things um, because I think it really helps you become a good communicator and someone who's thank you you know really em- empathetic and able to work with people of all walks of life. So, um, yeah, I really enjoyed speaking to you. We'll have to do this more often. I'd love to do it. I'd love to come back. And and, uh, I know I went all over the place today, uh, but I I really enjoyed it. I'd love to come back and chat again. Um, Definitely. I definitely just love making people think, you know, you don't have to agree with everything I said. I would not, I would be really pissed if you agreed with everything I said. Mm. Uh, I think there needs to be discourse. There needs to be disagreement. There needs to be open debate and challenge. And it needs to be done in a respectful, uh, common sense way. I think one of the biggest problems with today is people just like will not disagree and, and have like very like that's part of being a dude and being a man is being able to like have discourse, you know, and or, or just a human in general. Like you should be able to express your opinion in a logical, very non-emotional way. And you should be able to be like, well, I understand where you're coming from and then come to a conclusion of like, OK, we don't really see eye to eye on this issue, but we can still be friends and I respect your opinion. Um, that, that's been, that's huge. That, that, that that's been lost. And, and it's really unfortunate because um, it's really sad that a lot of people will literally write somebody off just because of one thing. Right. And, and it's really funny in our modern world, the people that preach tolerant tolerance seem to be the least tolerant. Yeah, conversations like this give me, um, give me optimism though. And I think, I think we have good reason to think that the pendulum is going to come back because I, I, yeah I think I think you're right and I hope you're right and and I, I think I think there's going to be more people I think more people are starting to uh, wake up and be like this is just getting way too out of control like we've got to put the brakes on this stuff like I think you're gonna you're starting to see some very prominent people stand up and say look, this is just going way too far. Like we've got to, we got to put the brakes on this. So I hope you're right. But um, regardless, I'm still going to help as many people as I can. And I'm going to do my thing. And I appreciate you having you on the show. And uh, I, I'm glad to see you're, you're doing this. It's, it takes a lot of courage to get on these shows and, and, and talk about what you think and, and to challenge yourself. And uh, I thank, thank you for having me on. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. I really hope you enjoyed our conversation. I've left some links to Jim's work in the episode notes if you'd like to learn more about what he's doing. I've also started a Substack where you're able to read more in-depth ideas of mine pertaining to health, light, water, systems biology, and much more. This gives me a way to expand on the ideas discussed in these podcasts and be more specific about the ways in which these ideas are applicable to your own health and wellness. So please check it out with the link in the description if you want to dig deeper with me. I've also left links to all the other platforms I'm on. So if you want to connect, feel free to reach out. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Take care, everyone.